on Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in the performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. Further support is provided by Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, one of America's leading urban public libraries, delivering exceptional services and programs with a mission to improve lives and build a stronger community and by the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's resource hub and lead advocate for the regional cultural community, providing culture for all. I'm optimistic about the future, especially now, you know, when I see what these what these kids from Marjorie Stoneman and Douglas are doing and the passion that they bring, um, I am not afraid for, for my kids' future. We have encouraged them to be politically active and I certainly hope that they that they are. They're compassionate human beings. They've learned that from us and they've learned that from other people around them. So I Hope that they do become more active politically as they get older. But, you know, kids are incredibly sophisticated these days with with how they use media and how they use their voice. And so I am I'm excited to, to see to see change. Candace Langston is a communications consultant who helps organizations make a positive impact in their communities. She previously was a principal at Solid, a strategic communications and civic engagement firm. Her career includes serving as Director of Development and Strategic Partnerships for the UNC Charlotte College of Arts and Architecture, an Advancement Consultant for Time Out Youth, and as a Business Director and Senior Marketing Manager for Sotheby's. Candace is the founder and former owner of Potion, a chain of indie skincare and fragrance boutique shops. In this episode, we explore what makes a good message, civic engagement, TED Talks, Audrey Hepburn, Hello Kitty, and the music of Duran Duran. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Candace, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Mark. It's nice to be here. What an interesting life you lead, serial entrepreneur civic engagement strategist, arts maven, fashionista, neighborhood activist, pop culture connoisseur. How do you think of yourself? That sounds awfully interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do think of myself as, as all of those things. I have sort of cobbled together, I guess, a, a, an, an interesting life, at least, you know, for, for me. I didn't set out to do any of those things. I think you sort of find your way. Well, you've done many things professionally that we will explore. What are you doing currently? I am a communications consultant, so I work for myself and whatever client um, I'm engaged with at the moment. What does it mean to be a communications consultant? I work with clients who have a need to communicate a message or to craft a new message to reach new audiences or to get current audiences to either do something different or, or act on something that the organization is, is wanting to, to launch. So civic initiatives, anything from like how to reach out to new customers, reach new audiences, that kind of thing. What is an example of what you are doing? I am working with a large Fortune 500 company right now, helping them to engage on a deeper level with their small and medium-sized business clients um, as an effort to, to strengthen relationships and to learn how they can serve that segment of their, of their customer base more efficiently and, and better for the long run. How do you do that, Candace? If I'm a client, a Fortune 500 company, a small business, and I want to craft a message and deliver it to a particular audience, and I come to you, 
what happens? What's the process with you? Well, initially, I, I talk with the organization to understand what their overall goal is. So if the overall goal is to, you know, to, to increase sales, that requires a different, a different approach than say launching uh, an initiative. So we'll, we'll talk about goals and then we'll talk about what their current message is and where they think they are succeeding or not succeeding. Um, but the first thing that I, that I do with the project is to, to talk to the clients. So talk to the end user and we do that through focus groups. I do it through one on one interviews in, in person, really talking to, to the end user about what their experience has been, good and bad. And I do that f- for a long period of time. So at the end of this sort of series of, of conversations, themes come up typically that really point to what the roadmap should be for, for the client. So I am able to say, look, this is what your clients think of you now. This is where you want to go. So how are we going to get from there to, to here. What is it that you deliver? So it, it could be a, 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 a range of things. There, there is a written document. So a, a strategic plan that tells the organization exactly what they need to do and lays out steps for them to execute. And sometimes we help them execute and sometimes we just deliver the plan and, and, and they do it themselves. There's, there's almost always a suite of, of new graphics, new materials for them to use. So there's almost always a new logo or brand mark, a new tagline. There might be a new website or fresh freshening up a current website. There might be social media involved. I'm constantly struck at how unsophisticated organizations are with social media as, as much talent as there is here in Charlotte. There's really no, no excuse for an organization in 2018 to not really have nailed social media. So there's, there's always something, you know, in, involved, involving um, external communications, how to go about doing that. And then we do training, we do training for, you know, the organization staff, you know, about why we've gone about doing this work and what the new message is, um, how to communicate it. And so that's, that's, that's basically what it is that, that we do. And we sometimes stay engaged with these clients for, for months after we've really wrapped up the, the strategic plan. You mentioned social media, and we are in a new world. We live in a world of constant 24-7 media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, radio, television, print, even podcasting. When a client comes to you about messaging, what do you say to them about navigating all these different media platforms? Yeah, it is. Um, it's a it's a it's a clouded landscape for for sure. But you have to start somewhere. So the first the first thing that we that we that we try to do is understand where they're getting the most traction currently. So you know, Facebook and Twitter is not for every organization. Um, it's important to have a presence, but if it's not your if it's not where your clients are currently, then, you know, you shouldn't waste your time or you shouldn't spend a majority of your time working on that. So we just sort of try to narrow down where their current clients are um, and craft messages and, and work on the delivery system for, for that aspect first. And then if we need to build a website or build a website for them or um, build a Facebook page for them or establish a Twitter presence, then we'll, we'll work on that. There's an old catchphrase by Marshall McLuhan that says the medium is the message. How do you interpret that? That's, that's true. It's, it's, it's true even more today because there are so many mediums. I think there's a, there's a way of communicating on Twitter that's different from how you communicate on Facebook. That's different from how you communicate on your website. But the thing that I would want every organization to to understand is people are getting, they're getting their news, they're getting their media from their handheld devices. So, you know, it's important to, to craft strong, concise, consistent 
messages. So make sure that you look the same on Facebook and Twitter and your website and that your mobile website is really on point. There's just no room for error. Consumers are so sophisticated now that, you know, they're, they're, they're going to see where you're failing. And if you're inconsistent in your message, it, it really destroys credibility. Messages are being consumed within seconds. How is it that you break through the clutter and convey a powerful idea when someone is just swiping left and right and scrolling so quickly? Yeah, the important thing to me, Mark, is is authenticity. I think that you, you, you have to know who you are, you as a person, you as an organization. You've got to be consistent, and, and it has to be real. People see through in authenticity. And, uh, so I think that's, that's the key. There's a certain irony, don't you think, in retaining a consultant to help you be authentic? There is, but you know, people don't like to sit down and really think about this. You know, it's hard to sort of tear your, tear your own self apart. Um, you, you almost do need, you know, someone to bounce things off mm-hmm. of. So I, I find myself in a lot of instances feeling like a, like a therapist. Let me run something by you. Going back to Marshall McLuhan, he said that the media is an extension of our senses. And in a global village brought together by media, our sensory perceptions merge together. And we begin seeing and feeling the same thing. We are in a shared media sensorium. What do you make of that? Well, I think about folks that I know who have who have sworn off Facebook or you know sworn off Twitter because what they're seeing is depressing and so you know in order to sort of carve that out of their life they have to you know they have to get off social media the news is so instantaneous these days the school shooting you know we were all going through that almost in real time and so it, it's so instantaneous that it's impossible to distance yourself from it. I, I think, and you know, especially now that we're so addicted to our devices and and seeing and and hearing the good and the bad. But I, I think this is certainly something that we're experiencing on a on a daily basis. I can only imagine what his take would be on the media landscape today, but this notion that our iPhone is really a, a sensory device Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we're all touching, tasting, feeling, and interpreting the same senses through that iPhone at the same time. And I wonder how it all sort of impacts how we act in the world as a result. Yeah. You know, when you, when you look at how people have blinged out their iPhones and, you know, you, you have to make a conscious decision. Do I want the rose gold or do I want the gunmetal gray? You know, it really is an extension of, of, of what he's saying. You know, it's, it's not just a device anymore. It's just, it's, it's an, an extension of our bodies. Candace, what makes for a good message? Authenticity, as I said, clarity, consistency, I think humor is also something that we don't use it often enough. We don't use humor often enough. Um, I think it sort of helps to break down barriers and overcome differences between people. We will talk about your own messaging on Facebook. There is authenticity. There is consistency. There is humor. Candice, what is the message you think we all need to hear that you would want to help deliver? Well, for for Charlotte right now, I think the message is if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. I know that's been said before and about other things, but because there's such a huge community conversation going on around economic mobility and what are we going to do to, you know, to, to, to fix this huge, huge, big problem. I think that we all have to participate in whatever capacity we, we can as individuals and, you know, as leaders, 
we have to we have to get proximate, as Brian Stevenson says um, in his book Just Mercy. And yeah, there's something that each one of us can do to solve the problem, and we just have to jump in and start doing it. Candice, you grew up in the same neighborhood that you are living in now. Where did you grow up? I grew up on the east side, so near near Plaza Midwood, the corner of Central and Eastway. There's a an old, old neighborhood called Medford Acres, and I grew up there. What are your memories of Medford Acres as a child? I had a great childhood. Um, I'm an only child. My dad traveled for work all the time, so it was mostly me and my mom. And um, I grew up, you know, with the same group of kids that I'm still friends with now. It was, you know, it was a fairly low key and great, great time to grow up in Charlotte. I was very, was very lucky. Went to Winterfield um, first through fourth and then to Mary Oaks and then to Eastway Junior High and then to Garinger. So you were an only child. Mm -hmm. What was that like for you? I loved being an only child. Loved it. Still do. From time to time, my mom would ask me, how do you feel about being an only child? And, you know, there was never any, I never felt like I was missing anything, not having a, not having a sibling. I had tons of friends. My mom made sure of that. She was very involved in school. She was, I think from the time I was in the second grade, practically all through high school, even she was like the president of the PTA. And at one point in junior high, she started substitute teaching for my chorus class. She's, my mom was a great singer. And so Mr. Ledbetter, my chorus teacher, found out that my mom could sing. And um, he would bring her in from time to time. And that was just the most humiliating experience. But everybody loved my mom. She was a party girl. You know, she dressed to the nines and she always had on high heels and lots of makeup. And so they loved, everybody loved my mom. She's, she's a, she's a fantastic lady. I'm hearing some similarities. <laughs> yes. Although I am quite the opposite. I'm not involved in, in, uh, in my kid's school, um, probably for that reason. But yeah, my mom definitely inspired my love of makeup and clothes and all that. And your dad? My dad worked for a tobacco company and traveled a lot. He was a marketing executive, so he was constantly on the road. So he would leave on Sunday night to, you know, wherever he was going for that week. And he would, you know, he'd come home on like Thursday. So he was gone a lot. But my mom and I traveled with him from time to time whenever we could. But he was always, you know, either unpacking or packing a suitcase. These friends that you've had all your life, how would they have described you back in the day? I think they would have said in a loving way that I was stuck up. Actually, sh very shy, though. Very much, you know, into the, the clothes and hair, music, you know, loved music. Funny, kind, open door at my house. My, my friends were always at my house. Because my dad worked in the tobacco business, he also had relationships with all the, the, the candy companies because tobacco and candy are wholesaled in the same places or were back then. So we always had the most amazing candy cabinet. And literally my friends would come over after school and sit in front of this cabinet, much like this one that you have here and just station themselves there and just eat candy all day. You were the fun candy house. In the I was the fun. And you know, I'm, I'm still the fun candy house. We still have tons of candy at my house. Yes. Candace, you went to Garinger High School. What were you like then? I didn't I didn't date a lot in high school. I think I had like one date because I was too shy to really like talk to any boys, but I didn't play any sports. I was in a couple of clubs, but I had a really tight knit group of, of girlfriends and we did everything together. We had an amazing high school experience. You know, Charlotte was a very different town back then than it is now. And uh, we made, you know, full use of when we all got our driver's licenses. And there might have been a fake ID involved in, in one of these stories. But yeah, we had, we had a great time. We, we really did. And I'm very, very fortunate that I'm still friends with those girls to, to this day. And you were listening to music. Yes. 
listening to it. What was on the turntable? Pretty much the, the same thing that's on the turntable now, Mark. I listened to, you know, Journey and Motley Crue and Poison and Guns N' Roses. Hair bands. And, yeah, hair bands, big time. Um, of course, you know about my, my love of British 80s music. So that was definitely playing too. You know, back then we didn't get shows like we do now, you know, concerts like, like we do now. And so anytime a band came through town, I was there. You know, I went to every, every concert at the old, old Coliseum. And Queens actually used to have really good, really good concerts. So I went to all those and yeah, I was really into the club scene. That was a little bit later when I was in college, but. What were the clubs that were current back then? Um, well, the Pterodactyl, Park Elevator, 1313. This is going way, way back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, you know, they were, they were small clubs, but they, because there was not much going on in Charlotte, you know, in the, the music scene, you tended to just sort of gravitate from night to night to all the clubs. So if I met Candace at the Pterodactyl when you were 18 years old, <laughs> who would I have met? You would have met the exact same person that is sitting across the table from you now, but with longer hair and more makeup. I was probably not dancing. I have been told by everyone who knows me and has seen me dance that I shouldn't do that. So that was not... I definitely looked the part. Oh, you had to look the part. That was, you know, that was 90% of it is the time that you spent getting made up. You went to Queens University Mm -hmm. of Charlotte and studied art history. Mm Mm-hmm. Why Queens and why art history? Well, Queens because I was a, I was too afraid to go very far from home. I didn't want to leave my parents. And I had a serious boyfriend in Charlotte, and I wanted to, to be, be close. And there was plenty to do in Charlotte back then, and I loved my professors. And college was a struggle for me academically. And so just, I think, having the safety net of home and friends made the college experience for me a little easier. From there, you went to Southern Methodist University in Dallas and studied arts administration and earned an MA and an MBA. What were those years like? Well, I worked for a couple of years after college and realized that um, although I had I had studied art history, um, I had no skills for the real world. So I had met my now husband by then and he was he's German and had gotten gotten admitted to SMU to get his MBA and so I had a decision to make I could either go with him to Texas or we could break up or we could do the long distance thing and so you know my dad helped me make the decision that I probably should go and get a graduate degree and SMU had a, and and they still do, they have a wonderful um, program where you can get an MBA while you're getting your master's in arts administration. So that seemed like a, like a wonderful thing, a perfect fit for me. I wanted to work for an auction house. I don't know where that came from. I was always real. I I read W magazine from the time that I was, you know, at, at least in high school. And they were always talking about Sotheby's and Christie's. And so I wanted to work for one of them. And um, so this seemed like a, a path to be able to to do that. And that's exactly what happened next for that you, isn't exactly it? That is exactly what happened next. You yes. went to work for Sotheby's in London and in New York. That sounds glamorous. Was it glamorous? It was incredibly, incredibly glamorous. Yeah. And that's one of the things that attracted me to it. I think very international and seeing amazing art on a constant basis. And the people that I met there, there just was, there's no parallel to that, to having your, having your eyes wide open like that. This is the mid 1990s. Yes. In London. Mm Mm-hmm. Where did you live and what was that life like? We lived in South Kensington where all of the other Americans live. It's like when you get to London, the real estate agents, if you're American, only show you like two neighborhoods. So we lived in South Kensington and Felix was commuting to mostly to Portugal and Spain um, for his job. And it was just a 
a, a great experience. And Felix is your husband. Felix is my husband. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. what did you do for Sotheby's? I was a business director, which meant that I oversaw all the financial aspects for the European marketing division. So Sotheby's is, is headquartered in London. Their, their global headquarters is in London. We did all of the European marketing from that office. And my boss was American, another American, amongst a bunch of Brits. And actually, it was very international. Sotheby's is a very international company. But my, my boss and I were sort of like the Cagney and Lacey of that, of that office. I visited London a couple of times in the mid-1990s, and I remember 20- and 30- and 40-year-olds who three, four, five times a week would regularly go out to the pubs and to dinners and, mm-hmm. and have dinners at long tables, and everyone would date everyone <laughs> at some time or another. <laughs> Boyfriends and girlfriends would be swapped. It sounds a lot like high school. <laughs> it does, but it was just an exciting intellectual scene and so much fun. And were you part of that? Was that life? What was your life like in London? So we moved there in 97 and, you know, we were considered expats. We made friends, all of our friends in London who we're still friends with today were other Americans, even though Felix is is German. I think he sort of halfway considers himself an American, but they were all Americans and they were all from Texas. I don't know how that happened, but, you know, we had kind of a little American click. You probably know, having spent time in, in Britain, that it's hard to make friends with British people. It's just a thing. I don't, I, I can't really explain it, but they, they're friendly and they're wonderful and they're warm people, but they just don't invite you to come over. So we had very much a little click, a little American. And they are very clickish, and they've known each other since their public school days. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're just not super open. So I guess in that respect, I am kind of British, you know, not being super, super open. But yeah, it's that was very much our experience. What did you learn about yourself working at Sotheby's? I learned that I have a very low tolerance for backstabbing and for cutthroatness. I know that's not a word, but I'm going to make one up today. And even though I, I, I stayed at Sotheby's for many years, that's eventually what sort of inspired me to do something else, to move on. It's a, it's a very cutthroat type of, type of business. More so in New York than in, in London. My experience in New York was very different from my from my time in London. I'm not someone who is comfortable looking over their shoulder to see who's coming up behind them. And I'm very much a, a team player. I lay all my cards out on the table. I don't throw colleagues under the bus, and I saw that happening left and right all around me and realized that I was probably not going to do well in that, in that arena. It's, it's very, it's very global. It's very competitive. The fact that I found myself there is, it's almost miraculous. You know, you don't, you don't get a great job at, at Sotheby's or Christie's for that matter, without some intense connections, you know, coming from the East side of Charlotte, I didn't have any. So, you know, I really had to work hard to, to get a foot in the door there, but my persistence definitely paid off for me. And I loved my time there. But like I said, seeing the, seeing the sacrifices that other people made, it, they, they just weren't sacrifices that I was that I was willing to make. You had this lifelong dream of working in an auction house, and here you are at Sotheby's, both in London and New York. Was it disappointing to leave? Not disappointing. No, I mean I knew that it was that it was time. I felt like I had I had accomplished a lot, and you know had really gone far. You know, I was a I was a senior uh, marketing director at Sotheby's. That's pretty remarkable. That I sort of stayed with it that long. But I, I knew that it was that it was time to go and I feel I felt like I had done everything, you know, that I wanted that I wanted to do. I met 
some amazing people and, you know, got to go, go to some incredible parties and plan some incredible parties and see amazing art. And so it was, I think it's, it's always good when you can go out on a high. One of the things that you did was help relaunch the brand of Sotheby's. Yep. Uh, so in the late 90s, um, Sotheby's chairman, Alfred Taubman, was uh, sent to prison for collusion with Christie's. And the company felt that it was really sort of time to wipe the slate clean, have a kind of a fresh start. And so they hired a, a new global director of marketing. Almost always when something like that happens, that person wants to change the logo. So that's what we did. It was a very long, very intense, complex process. Um, I had never done anything like that before, and it was hugely educational for me. You know, I still refer back to those times for, okay, what do I do? I learned a lot. Candace, you left New York and found your way back to Charlotte. Why Charlotte? Hometown. My, my parents were here then. I wanted to be closer to them. They were getting older. And I felt like it was a place that I could really make a mark. You know, it was not too big that I wouldn't, you know, have a voice and not too small that it would feel that it would be boring. One of the marks that you made was you started an entrepreneurial career and you launched a company called Potion. Um, what was Potion? Uh, we started out with one store and we sold indie and really high end brands of makeup and skincare and fragrance. How did that come about? After college, my first job was with Chanel. I sold makeup and then they promoted me and I did events for them. So I had lots of connections in the cosmetic industry and a love, a lifelong love of makeup. And um, it was just something that I really wanted to do. And in New York and, and actually in London too, there were a couple of others of other uh, concepts similar to Potion. And I thought, you know, this is really something that, that, that I, can, I can actually do this. I think we had maybe 900 square feet. You don't need a lot of room for makeup, but we had a we had a great time. We had you know amazing clients that I'm still in touch with and consider definitely friends and and family. And what became of Potion? I sold it in 2008, and we signed the paperwork the same day that Lehman Brothers announced they were going bankrupt. And you remember, from that day forward, it was bad news after bad news. So um, you timed it well. I, I it was very serendipitous. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Good time to get out of retail. And what happened after potion? I took some time off and focused on my, my two little kids and just trying to figure out what my next thing was. I did some consulting for Time Out youth, uh, which was a wonderful experience. I, I'm such a fan of of, uh, of them and really a supporter of the work that they're doing in the community and eventually found my way to UNCC. And what did you do at UNCC? I was the director of development and strategic partnerships for the College of Arts and Architecture. And what did you do there? I raised a bunch of money <laughs> for special projects. We had a lot of amazing um, initiatives while I was there, scholarships as well. So I, I, I was the that I was the fundraiser for the college. Here you are in uh, an arts college, arts and architecture college, doing marketing, doing fundraising. What was that time like for you? It was incredible. Ken Lambla is the, the dean of, of the college and is one of in my top three is, of, of people that I admire. He's, he's right at the top. He's, he's amazing um, to work for and, and to know. Um, and he has populated the college with with equally um, admirable and talented people. Uh, had a had an amazing experience there. But you chose to leave. I chose to leave. Yes, I really wanted more flexibility. My kids were getting older. I wanted to give them what my mom had given me, which is time um, and engagement with them. So I wanted to be able to be home with them when they got home from school in the afternoons or take a day off 
with them, you know, if they needed to, if they were sick or if there was a play at school. And I was at the, at a time in, in my life and in our family's life that, that I could do that and, and still pay the bills. So. Candace, you just talked about this time in your life when you were working at UNC Charlotte with a job that you loved, but you were also a mom with two children and you faced a choice that a lot of professional women face, which is balancing family responsibilities with career ambitions. How did you work that out? I have a very supportive spouse who knew that I had this yearning to give my kids more of myself than they were, than they were getting and who offered me the stability to be able to, to do that and still, you know, maintain our, our lifestyle. And so it really wasn't, it really wasn't a hard decision. I could have stayed in my job and advanced and probably still been happy myself, but my kids would have missed something. Um, They would have missed an opportunity to, you know, to come home and have a parent there. And because I had been given that by, by my mother, I, I felt I have a, I had a small window to be able to do that. So, you know, they were in, they were in first and third grade at the time. And, you know, we could have, we could have paid for a great babysitter. We did for a little while to pick them up and do their homework. And she was, she was wonderful, but it's different having a parent there. And so even though I'm a, I do consider myself a career woman and always will have a job. I didn't, I, I wasn't on a career track, you know, head, headed, headed this, this office or that, that position. And I, you know, I admire women and men who can do that and, and do do that, but it's just a, a choice that, that I made for, for myself and for my family. Candace, you went to work for a company called Solid, working with a good friend, Tracy Russ, mm-hmm. and you provided communications, branding, and community programming support to different initiatives in town, including the Charlotte Mecklenburg Opportunity Task Force. What was the message of the task force that you helped shape? And did you get it right? And initially the message was, we have this problem in Charlotte. We're 50th on this list. We have to do something about it. We have formed a task force to study it and to come up with recommendations, but it's not up to the task force to solve the problem. It's up to the community to solve the problem. And in order to do that, the community has to understand what it means to be 50th on this list. And it's a very, as you know, complicated, hairy problem with many tentacles that's going to take decades to fix. So initially the message was, this is what we're doing. We need your help. So, and you asked, did we get it right? And I think that that remains to be seen. I do see, I do see changes. And I, I, I believe that the task force laid out a very comprehensive set of recommendations that are, uh, that I, I can see being acted on. But because the problem was so many years in the making, I think the solution is as well. Candace, in 2009, you launched an initiative here in Charlotte that became quite exciting. What was it? What did you do? TEDx Charlotte. And TEDx is the, is the program that TED launched in, I believe, 2008 that allows cities and organizations to have their own TED experience. I first read about it in 2009. I had been a TED fan for many, many years, going back to um, even to London. One of the executives at Sotheby's was a, you know, watch the videos. I mean, back then it was really underground. And so I read about TEDx, the, the TEDx program, and 
because I had, you know, some, some free time and, and some free energy, I emailed Ted and I said, hey, you know, I'm in Charlotte and I'd love to volunteer if there's a TEDx program, you know, in Charlotte. And they said, well, there isn't one. Why don't you start one? So I filled out the application and I think it was, I think it was Christmas Eve that I got the email that they had approved my license. And I was like, well, what does that mean? So it was pretty much off to the races from, from there planning the, the first event, which was in 2010. Well, talk more about it because it certainly had an impact here in town. It brought a lot of people together mm -hmm. and it in some ways became, it helped initiate many other kinds of series here in the city. Yeah, I, I agree. And I'm, I'm glad you said that. It, it, it makes me feel good when other people understand the, the sort of big spark that, that that was. And it was certainly not not because of me. We put together a great organizing team. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. TEDx was a really new program at the time. I relied a lot on the folks in Asheville who had done an event to sort of guide me and give me pointers and tips. And they said, the first thing you have to do is put together a team. So I started reaching out to folks that I, that I knew and said, you know, who do you think might be interested in, in doing this? And um, back in 2009, I still had to explain to people what TED was. It's obviously a, it's a global phenomenon times 10 now, but it was, an, it was a new concept back then. So put together a great team um, that's still pretty much intact to this day and still planning the TEDx Charlottes today, even though Wynn Madry now um, is, the, is the lead organizer I do other things now. But yeah, I think you can trace a lot of kind of what's happening in Charlotte now back to, you know, those first couple of couple of events. Mm -hmm. You're proud of it, aren't you? Very proud. Very yeah. proud. Yeah. Is there a particular TEDx presentation in Charlotte that you remember? Yes, but I'm not going to talk about my favorites because that would be like picking one of my children over the other. But yeah, I certainly have some favorites. My favorite... TED Talk, though, is Brian Stevenson's talk that he gave at, um, at TED in 2013. And I happened to be at TED Active that year, so I got to see his talk live. And it was, it was amazing and it, 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 life changing. Hmm. Candace, you are also part of American Leadership Forum this year. Yes. Tell us about ALF and what you're doing. Uh, it's a program uh, designed for leaders to, to, to dive more deeply into problem solving and community engagement and working together to solve big problems. So we're almost finished with our, with our session. I think we have maybe three more classes to go. But it's been an, an incredible experience. My, my cohort is amazingly close. I know that we're going to we're going to be close even after ALF con concludes. And I know that you guys had to sleep in the woods and we, we didn't, we, we only had to do three days of outward bound and we got to stay in the cabin. So we're, we got the, we got the cush, the cush option. Is there an insight that ALF has helped you arrive at? Part of ALF is the outward bound portion and Part of the outward bound portion is the grueling hikes and the ropes course, which I was convinced that I would not be able to complete. But I did. And, you know, I wasn't even the last one on the ropes course. I was like, I'll go first. But, you know, doing that, it's a, for someone like me, a huge physical challenge because I'm, I'm not athletic. You know, I, I didn't, I barely even had tennis shoes before ALF. But, completing that and you know it's, it's such a sense sense of accomplishment it really makes you realize that there's almost nothing that we can't do when we set our minds to it candace on this show we talk about higher purposes what a person cares about most and that leads me to you and duran duran yes finally what's the deal with you and the fab five so when I was in the 10th grade, I went to Grapevine Music on Independence Boulevard, and I was digging through the videotapes, 
and I pulled out this video compilation from this group I'd never heard of, but they looked great. So I rented it, went home, watched it with a friend, and we were completely hooked. I cannot explain it. I don't know what it was about them or their music or their look. It is just, it's a, it's a phenomenon for me. Candace, let's play word association. Simon Laban. Frontman. John Taylor. Elegant. Nick Rhodes. The controller. Roger Taylor. The shy one. Andy Taylor. Oh, Andy. Yeah, poor Andy has really, he's, he's come and gone a lot. He's the wayward son. How many shows of Duran Duran have you seen? I've seen at least 30. The last one was New Year's Eve in, in Vegas. Yeah. Favorite song? My favorite song is Notorious. And this was not even like the, the original iteration of Duran Duran. This was after Roger and Andy left. And it was just Simon and Nick and John. That's my favorite song. I don't know. It's it's cosmopolitan and it's light. And I just never get tired of, of, of hearing it. Do you know where the name Duran Duran came from? The movie, Barbarella. Yes. The villain was Duran Duran. Yes. Dr. Duran Duran from the movie Barbarella. You know, I've watched the movie. It's, you know, it's a strange movie. It's a very strange movie. Um, I've watched the movie and uh, it's, I mean, there's no other name that would fit this group. So, Candace, at the very beginning, I said you're a bit of a fashionista and I'd love for you to read this quote and talk to me about it. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Yep. I can't be groundbreaking if I'm itchy. I love a, tur- a turtleneck. I feel naked without huge hoop earrings. I also love subtle, humorous details like the bunny ears and tail on my sneakers. Most days, I feel like Audrey Hepburn crossed with Hello Kitty. What a great quote. Yeah. Audrey Hepburn combined with Hello Kitty. Yeah, that's that's true. Mm-hmm. Has that been your look? Probably not forever, but, you know, certainly in, in my... In my, in my adult life, yeah. I've experimented, as we all do, with different things. Yeah. But, you know, you settle into something and it, it, it just works. So there, it's not a coincidence that I'm wearing a black turtleneck and huge hoop earrings today. What are you optimistic about? I'm optimistic about the future, especially now. You know, when I see what these, what these kids from Marjorie Stem and Douglas are doing and the passion that they bring... Um, I am not afraid for, for my kids' future. We have encouraged them to be politically active, and I certainly hope that they that they are. They're compassionate human beings. They've learned that from us, and they've learned that from other people around them. So I hope that they do become more active politically as they get older. But, you know, kids are incredibly sophisticated these days with with how they use media and how they use their voice. And so I am, I'm excited to, to see, to see change. What moves you emotionally? When I talk about my kids, I'm feeling a little bit emotional right now. I could probably see it. If, if you start to cry, Mark, I will cry with you. Even if I don't know what you're crying about, I'm just really, really soft hearted. But, you know, seeing, seeing someone achieve their dream makes me, you know, makes me want to cry. What else do you want to do? I want to just continue to do what I'm doing now. I think that I do have a lot more uh, to do and, and, and more to be able to give back. I'm happy with my life as it is. I might run for office someday. I don't know. We'll see. I'm not planning on it, but that could be in the cards. Candace, that's burying the lead at the end of the show. <laughs> Tell me more. I, the, nothing specific, um, but it has crossed my mind. I think we have amazing leaders, and it's not because um, I, 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 I'm not confident in, in our current leadership, but I feel like I, I have uh, a responsibility to give back. So even if it's not running for office, if it's, if it's supporting other people that, that are who I believe in, I'll, 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 I'll be engaged. Yeah. What is the office that you think you might want to hold? I don't know. It could be city council or, or county commission or or uh, maybe even school board. But my, you know, my, my kids are, are young and I love spending time with them now. So 
you know, it, at least in the next few years, it's not something that I would entertain, but you know, in, in five years, perhaps. Well, now that the news is out you might be drafted, there might be a, a draft Candace movement. <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe I want to take that back after this. <laughs> I'd like to end on this question, Candace. What do you value most? I value relationships the most. I think that's at the heart of, of everything we do. It's why we get get up in the morning and go to work and it's why we become politically active because we care about the people around us, our friends and our family and and our, our neighbors. Thanks for your time today, Candace. Thank you, Mark. Candace Langston is a communications consultant. She earned a bachelor's degree in art history from Queen's University of Charlotte and a master's degree in arts administration and an MBA from Southern Methodist University. And now, a personal word. When I think of Candace Langston, I think of British New Wave music, heavy eyeliner, padded shoulders, synthesizer pop, and androgynous girls and boys. She is a time traveler from the 1980s club music scene, a muse in spirit to Nick Rhodes and John Taylor, confidant to all the sounds and lyrics of Duran Duran. Her glam eyes are VH1 and MTV. But Candace Langston is so much more. She is a business owner, a wife, and mother. Above all, she is a citizen. She cares about what we say, how we say it, and who we say it to. She cares about the fabric of neighborhoods and community, and the city and nation our children will inherit. She embraces citizenship with passion, wanting to make a difference, leading causes, addressing legislators, her heart on her sleeve. She is also shy and funny, quiet in person, hilarious on Facebook. She posts the fashion of swinging London, the best-looking slice of lime since the lime shortage of 2014, and pictures of Japanese flying squirrels. Every time I see Candace, I'm reminded of a close friend I had in the mid-1980s named Anya. Anya was a German-American-only child who grew up in the U.S. Virgin Islands. She was loyal and kind and very happy being alone and different. She wore her blonde hair short and cut on an angle. She had dozens of black rubber bangles on her wrist, and a British New Wave soundtrack followed her wherever she went. Depeche Mode, The Pet Shop Boys, Simple Minds, Tears for Fears, The Human League. There is one song that always brings me back to moments with her, Don't Dream It's Over by Crowded House. I never quite took to New Wave. I was much more conventional in my dress and musical tastes preferring jeans and polo shirts and classic rock and rhythm and blues. But I loved that Anya had her edge, that she was sensitive and introspective, that she shaved the sides of her hair, colored it red, and wore black cat suits. That made her fun and daring and real. We are 30 years on from the mid-1980s. All of us who were young then are middle-aged now. We earn paychecks and pay taxes and provide for our families. Students who are the age now that we were then have iPhones and earbuds and download songs from the cloud and swipe and post and tweet. None of that would have made any sense back in our time. What does remain the same is our human condition, our sadness and joy, our yearning to connect, our desire for love and something more. We want the energy of the dance floor, the music of the band to move through us. We want what we want to last, as every day it slips away. That's the thing about soundtracks. They lift our mood and break our hearts. The notes come back from the past, only to fade away. Candace may be a time traveler, but she fully embraces the present and future. She is optimistic and hopeful. She engages with her compassion and humor. Her message is clear and consistent. Be the solution. Be the world you want to see. With apologies to Duran Duran, here's one for you, Candace. The reflex is a lonely child. 
who's waiting by the park. The reflex is a door to finding treasure in the dark. And watching over Lucky Clover isn't that bizarre. Every little thing the reflex does leaves you answered with a question mark. I'm on a ride and I want to get off, but they won't slow down the roundabout. I sold the radio and TV set, don't want to be around when this gets out. So why don't you use it? Try not to bruise it. Buy time. Don't lose it. This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to On Life and Meaning. Thank you to my partners, Andy Go, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. This is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform that allows you to support what you value. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening.